everyone for coming. This morning we're reading from Srimad Bhagavatam. And before reading from Srimad Bhagavatam, it may just be good to take some moments to reflect on why Srila Prabhupada brought the Srimad Bhagavatam to us. When Srila Prabhupada was leaving India, one person said to him, Oh Swamiji, I heard you're going to America. He said, No, no. The Bhagavatam is going to America. I'm simply holding it. So it's very interesting that Srila Prabhupada, he wanted to bring Srimad Bhagavatam to the West. Someone asked him, why bring Srimad Bhagavatam? It's a little complicated. It's a little difficult to understand. Maybe you can bring something a little more easier for people to digest. But no, Srila Prabhupada specifically wanted to bring Srimad Bhagavatam. In fact, he didn't want to leave for America until he had completed the translation of the first canto of the Bhagavatam. So it's very important for us to understand why is the Srimad Bhagavatam such a special literature. Now, uh, the Srimad Bhagavatam itself declares Sarve Vedanta Sadam Hi Srimad Bhagavatam Ishate 
तदसमृता तृप्त नान्यत्रृति क्वचि Sarva Vedanta Saram He. If you want to know what is the sar, the essence of Sarva Vedanta, all the Vedanta, Shrimad Bhagavatam Ishate. It can be contained and understood and grasped by reading Shrimad Bhagavatam. Tad rasam rita triptasya. One once once one has tasted Shrimad Bhagavatam na anyatra shyad rati kachit. Their rati, their attraction, will never go in any other place. In other words, Shrimad Bhagavatam contains the essence, and it fully satisfies the heart, such that if one actually understands how to relish Shrimad Bhagavatam, then uh, they will not look in any other place um, because they will be fully content. Now, Shrimad Bhagavatam, uh, Jiva Goswami. Who is the one who systemized all the philosophy of Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu? He is uh, one of the most prolific authors in the history of the universe. In fact, it said there's only one personality in the universe who wrote more verses than Jiva Goswami. Want to have a guess? Vyasadeva. Yeah. <laughs> That's pretty amazing. The only personality in the history of the universe who wrote more verses than Jiva Goswami is Vyasadeva himself, the compiler of the Vedic literatures. So Jiva Goswami was a prolific author. He said that he wrote over four hundred thousand verses. Just think about that for a second. Reading eighteen thousand verses of the Bhagavatam, reading it in itself is a task. Now think about writing four hundred thousand verses. That's what Jiva Goswami did. It's okay. It's okay. That's what Jiva Goswami did, and what Jiva Goswami does is in a book called the uh, Sandarbhas. Sandarbha literally means, like many of you, I think in Hindi or Gujarati, sand means to weave together. No, the weaving. Like Jara Sand, isn't it? He was put together by the demon Jara. So Sandarbha literally means to weave. So Jiva Goswami writes a book, uh, or multiple books, the Sandarbhas, and what they do is basically they weave together all the verses, the most important conclusions and siddhanta contained within Vedic literatures. And Jiva Goswami there presents the essence, um, and in the very very first book of the Sandarbhas, called Tattva Sandarbha, what Jiva Goswami does is he establishes why Shrimad Bhagavatam is the highest book in creation. So it's useful to understand what Jiva Goswami, how he establishes Shrimad Bhagavatam as the ultimate book. Because this can also be very, very useful in your preaching. So Jiva Goswami, e even in modern day philosophy, they say there's four strands of philosophy, and perhaps the most important strand of philosophy is known as epistemology. Have you heard of this? Epistemology means how do you know what you know. In other words, even before thinking of What the knowledge is, first you have to establish how do you find that knowledge. This is the first step to being becoming knowledgeable. First, you have to understand how do you find knowledge. So, what Jiva Goswami does in Tattva Sandarbha is he explains how you can discover Tattva. Tattva means truth, but Tattva means a very special kind of truth. Tattva means a truth which stands true in all times, places, and circumstances. Tattva can never change. Tattva can never be proved to be wrong. Tattva never needs to be upgraded or refined. Tattva stands true in all times, places, and circumstances. So, in Tattva Sandarbha, Jiva Goswami asks the question: How do you discover? What is tattva? What is true? 
So his strategy is very, very interesting. The first point he makes is this. He says there are three ways, broad ways of understanding something in this world. Number one, pratyaksha. Krishna. So the first way to understand something is pratyaksha. You understand it by your direct sense perception. We have eyes, we have ears, we have um, a nose, we have different knowledge acquiring senses. So therefore the first step or the first way to understand something is through your own senses. And then Jiva Goswami says another way to understand something is through anuman your logic, your mind. If A equals B and B equals C, then through our mind, even though we may not have seen it, we can conclude A equals C because that logically makes sense. So he says anuman. Man means the mind and anu means to follow. So the word for logic in Sanskrit is literally anuman, to follow the mind. And then he says the third way to understand something is Shabda. You understand it by hearing from someone who has more knowledge than yourself. So he said broadly speaking there are these three ways of understanding reality. And what he does through a series of arguments is he makes the point that if you try to understand reality through Pratyaksha and Anuman, ultimately you will not come to the highest conclusion. Why? Because the basic point is that your senses and your mind are limited. Right now we can't even see what's going on beyond this wall because our senses are limited. And our mind is also limited because our mind and everything our mind uses to logically come up with something is based on what our senses discovered in the past. And so he says, if you really want to understand something in the deepest way, you have to hear it from someone who has a higher perception. And then the second point he makes is that, okay, if we're saying that the way you understand knowledge is through Shabda, then who should you hear from? And he said the next problem or the next uh, thing that you have to overcome is you have to find a spiritual source from which to hear. Because if you hear from another material source, then even though you're not using your mind and senses, you're using the mind and senses of another limited person. Every single human being, he says, has four defects. Imperfect senses, illusion, cheating, and mistakes. And so he says the second point, first point, you have to hear from someone else. Second point, you should hear from an authority or a source which is a paurusheya. A paurusheya means non-human, non-limited, a spiritual authority. Then the third point he makes is, okay, we have to hear, point number one. Point number two, we have to hear from a spiritual source. But now there are so many spiritual bodies of knowledge around the world, so many religions. So how do you choose which religion? So the Vedic teachers explain that every religion can give you some spiritual elevation, but all religions are not the same. All spiritual sources of knowledge are not the same. There are certain objective measures which can tell you which is the most advanced theology in the world. I'll give you a few of the points. How do you know, if someone asks you, how do you know which religion is the highest? There has to be certain objective measures. So the first objective measure is detail of philosophy. 
how much detail is there in this theology that can answer all of the questions that anyone could conceivably come up with? The most detailed theology is the most advanced theology. Another one, intimacy. Which theology explains God in the most intimate and in the most confidential way? That theology must be the most advanced theology. Number three, which theology creates the most transformation in the practitioner? The theology which actually transforms the heart of practitioners in a profound way, that theology must be the highest theology. Number four, accessibility. Which theology can be practiced by anyone from any uh, level of consciousness? That theology must be the most advanced because the most advanced theology allows for anyone and everyone to participate. Number five, the most advanced theology in the world must be the most beautiful theology. It must have the best poetry. It must have the best descriptions. It must have the best artistic and cultural expression. So now, if you look at all the religions in the world, and on these five factors, you begin to mark each theology on objective measure, on objective analysis, you will find that there's no theology in the world which is more advanced than the Vedic theology. Because on every single one of these points, no theology can trump or be higher than the Vedic revelation. So therefore, Jiva Goswami says, third point, Yes, you have to go to a spiritual source, and there are many sources, but the source you should go to is the Vedas. Because there, there cannot be more advanced revelation than that. But then the fourth point he makes is that, but there's so many books in the Vedas. So which book shall I go to? Because so many books are there. So he says, yes, there are the four Vedas, there are Brahmanas, there are Aranyakas, there are Upanishads, there are so many auxiliary literatures. So he analyzes all the different books in the Vedas, and he says, there are a certain set of books in the Vedas that if you go to these books, then you will get the ultimate conclusion of everything. And through a variety of scriptural references, he establishes that if you want to understand the essence of the Vedas, then you have to go to the Puranas. He says Puranas is, Purana is connected to the word Purna, and Purna means perfect. So the Puranas are those books which establish and which present the perfect conclusion of what the Vedas are trying to teach you. And he says, okay, but there are 18 Puranas. So which Purana should we go to? Because there's 18 of them. So then he says, there are Puranas in Tamas, Puranas in Rajas, and Puranas in Sattva. There are Puranas which are in the ignorance, in the passion, and the goodness. So he says, naturally, if you want to find the highest, then you should go to the Puranas which are in Sattva, goodness. But there's six of them. So then which should you go to? Then he says, amongst the six Puranas in Sattva, there is one Purana, uh, which is an Amala Purana. And this Purana has no imperfection. This Purana has no material tinge. And this Purana throws away all uh, cheating religion. And that Purana is? Srimad Bhagavad. So this is the way in which Jiva Goswami establishes why this book is the conclusion of everything. Point number one, there are three ways of acquiring knowledge, but you have to learn by hearing. Point number two, don't hear from a material source. Hear from a spiritual source. But point number three, there are many spiritual sources, 
But yes, amongst them, the Vedic revelation is the highest on objective measure. Okay, but there are so many books in the Vedas. Yes, if you want to understand the essence of the Vedas, go to the Puranas. But there are 18 Puranas, yes, but they're divided in three. Therefore, go to the Puranas which are in the mode of Sattva. And amongst those in the Sattva, there is one Purana which is Amala. That is the Srimad Bhagavatam. And in this way he establishes that if you want to know anything, then the place to go is Srimad Bhagavatam. Now this is very, very powerful. Like now we're going to go out on book distribution and we're trying to share Krishna consciousness. Broadly in the world, you'll speak to three different types of people. One type of person will be like, why do I even need to read spiritual books? Another broad type of person will be, yeah, I'm a spiritual searcher, but why do I need to read Indian religion? I can read Christian, I can read Muslim, I can read other. And the third type of person is you'll meet the person who says, I know everything. <laughs> because I grew up in the Hindu religion, but why only Bhagavatam? We can read Shiv Purana, we can read that Purana, we can read Agni Purana. So broadly speaking in your preaching, you meet three types of people. An atheist, a spiritual searcher, and someone already within the Vedic kind of world. Jiva Goswami establishes how to establish to each one of these people why they should read Bhagavatam. To an atheistic person, you can explain. The reason you need to read this book is because your senses and mind are limited. And on that line of argument, you can defeat them. To a spiritual searcher who says, why the Indian religion? I can go to any religion. On the basis of Jiva Goswami, you can explain this is the highest revelation. You're not going to find any theology which is advanced as this. And to the person who's already looking into different Vedic scriptures, you can establish on the basis of Jiva Goswami's explanation that yes, you're reading so many books in the Vedas, but if you want to understand the essence, you're going to find it here. Who compiled all of the Vedas? Vedavyas. Vedavyas. When Veda Vyas wanted to summarize all of the Vedas into codes, which book did he write? Mm-hmm. Vedanta Sutra. And when he wanted to write a commentary on Vedanta Sutra, which is the essence of the Vedas, which book did he write? Mm-hmm. Srimad Bhagavatam. So who can know the essence of the Vedas better than the person who compiled the thing in the first place? Therefore, Jiva Goswami says, if you want to understand the Vedas, you have to read Bhagavatam. <coughs> so this is why Srila Prabhupada brought the Bhagavatam to America. Because on the basis of Bhagavatam, you can convince anyone uh, why they need to go on this path. So... Um, I thought just to give this little bit of introduction. Does anyone have any questions on this? Yeah. Yes. When you give the second point um, out of the five points that you gave on how you should see about the time, was he very detailed? The second one is intimacy. Mm-hmm. Which so first one is detail. Which has the most philosophical detail? Second one is intimacy. Which one describes the inner life of God, the inner mind of God? Which one describes how God exchanges love with his devotees? Which one explains what God is thinking, why God does what he does? Uh, This is intimacy. Third one I think I said was Transformation. transformation. Which one creates a transformation? If a theology doesn't transform, therefore, even when Rupa Goswami is explaining devotional service, what does he say? Kleshagni Shubhada Moksha Laguta Krit Sudurlaba Sandrananda Visheshatma Shri Krishna Karashini Chasa. The very sa- the, he says, Shubhada. By practicing devotional service, Shubhada. 
all auspiciousness will come. Auspiciousness will come in your life. Auspiciousness will come in those who are around you. Auspiciousness will come in the world because it transforms. Fourth one is accessibility. The most that you see, like Einstein, he said, if you can't explain it simply enough, you don't know it well enough. The best teacher can teach the most advanced thing to even someone who has very little qualification because the deeper you know something, the more simply you can understand it to anyone and everyone. Therefore, the Bhagavatam is simultaneously the highest philosophy and simultaneously made accessible to even someone who may not have so much qualification. Um, like that. So mm -hmm. accessibility, and then the fifth one I gave was um, beauty. Beauty. So another time I'll show you how beautiful uh, this theology is. Have you ever heard of Chitra Kavitwani? Okay. Maybe I'll show you this tomorrow morning. I'll show you the beauty of Rupa Goswami's poetry. It will blow your mind. Yeah, I'll show you tomorrow. Because you need to see that if there's a projector, I can show you. So this beauty, the beauty of the language, the beauty of the culture, the beauty of the art, um, the Vedic, the, 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 there's no beauty like this. So this is why, We're, when we go out and we say, this is the highest, this is the highest, it's not just some fanatical statement. On objective measure, you can establish that Krishna consciousness is the most advanced theology. Bhakti Tirtha Swami, once he went on national television and he said, if anyone can show me a more evolved theology than what I'm practicing, I'll convert to your religion right now. But you have to show on objective measure that it's more advanced. Is that okay? So sometimes people say there's Shruti, that which is heard, that which is directly emanating in the ether from the mouth of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and which is then passed down by sages through oral reception. And then there is Shmriti, that which is remembered by the sages, that which is then documented in histories like the Itihas, the Puranas, like that. So sometimes people make the argument that um, Shruti is somehow more authoritative than Shmriti because this is just some stories, this is just some uh, something that is uh, written down by sages. The first thing to understand is that these sages who are writing these things down, they are in uh, contact with the Supreme Lord. Rishi, the word Rishi comes from the Sanskrit word Drishya. Drishya literally means one who is seeing. So therefore Rishi, like for example, it's explained that when Vyasadev compiles Srimad Bhagavatam, then the language in which he's compiling it is Sanskrit, but in another sense it's what we call Samadhi Bhashya the language of trance. In other words, uh, the sages, they are completely connected to the absolute truth. And therefore, when they write, it's non-different. Therefore, when, for example, when we uh, 
talk about the ten offenses to the holy name. And we say to blaspheme the Vedic literatures or literatures in pursuance of the Vedic version. Because the idea is that which is compiled by those who are pure is non-different than the Supreme Lord himself. And therefore, Jiva Goswami also establishes, he says, Panchamo uh, Purusho uh, Veda, that the Puranas, the Upanishads themselves, the Chandogya Upanishad itself, says that the Puranas are the fifth Veda. So uh, even the Vedas itself, even the Shruti itself, says that the Shmriti or the histories are actually Vedic and they're actually uh, Praman, their authority. So that's why Jiva Goswami in Tattva Sandarbha, he's explaining this. That, and in one sense, we say, for example, that this is not the words of the Supreme Person, but the Bhagavad Gita is Krishna's words. Shri Bhagavan Uvacha. So although it's contained within the Mahabharat, it's still the direct words of the Supreme Lord which are documented by Vyasadeva. So in that sense, uh, the Itihas or the Shmriti or the Puranas are not any less than that. <coughs> any other questions from the... Um, how are we doing for time? What time are we going to? Eight. We'll go till eight? Okay. Well, should I read a verse then? Yeah. Okay, let's just read any verse. <laughs> Tell me, say stop. Stop. Okay, so we're reading from Canto number one, chapter number nine, entitled The Passing Away of Bhishma Dev. Today we're reading from text number 46. So just to give you a background to this, uh, Srimad Bhagavatam continues where the Mahabharat ends. So therefore the first canto of the Bhagavatam explains everything that happened when the Kurukshetra war ended. Therefore, if you look at the final chapters of the Mahabharat and you look at the structure of the first canto, you will actually see that they mirror each other. So what happens at the end of the Kurukshetra, many, many things happen, but one of the things that happens is that Yudhisthira is overwhelmed with grief because he has seen so many people uh, annihilated, uh, his cousins, so many people have died on the battlefield. And therefore, he feels guilty. He feels that because uh, he was to be made king, he was to be made emperor, that so much uh, suffering had to take place. And therefore, being bewildered, he decides to go to see Bhishma Dev. Bhishma Dev is on the bed of arrows. Bhishma Dev has the city that he can choose the time of his death. It's said that uh, in the Bhagavatam that Bhishma Dev is waiting for Uttarayana. Uttarayana means the rising sun. When the sun is at a certain point, then he is uh, waiting for that moment and then he will leave. But Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur says Uttarayana doesn't mean the rising sun. It doesn't mean that the sun is in a certain point. There is a person, Uta, Uttara Ayana. There is a personality who appeared in the womb of Uttara to save Parikshit. Who is that? Krishna. Krishna. So Bhishma Dev is not waiting for Uttarayana. He is waiting for Uttarayana. He is not waiting for the sun to appear at a certain point. He's waiting for Krishna to appear. And when Krishna is in front of him, once he's had darshan of Krishna, then he will decide to leave the world. So Yudhisthira 
he is bewildered Krishna knows Bhishma Dev is on the bed of arrows so Krishna puts two and two together and he says to Yudhisthira and the Pandavas let us go and visit Bhishma Dev and there on the bed of arrows Bhishma Dev begins to give many many different instructions Mahabharata is how many verses long? about a hundred thousand did you know that nearly half of the Mahabharat, half is Bhishma Dev's instructions on the bed of arrows. Did you know that? Nearly half of the whole Mahabharat is Bhishma Dev's instructions on the bed of arrows because he talks about all kinds of dharma, all kinds. Of so in the Bhagavatam is very very quick. We hear about, about the some instructions that Bhishma Dev gives but actually in the Mahabharat is, is a vast uh, vast part of the Mahabharat Bhishma Dev's instructions so um, so here we're hearing about the passing away of Bhishma Dev text number 46 Tasya nirharana andini samparetasya bhargava yudhisthira karayitva muhurtam dukito bhavat. Translation O descendant of Brigu Shonak, after performing funeral rituals for the dead body of Bhishma Dev, Maharaj Yudhisthira was momentarily overtaken with grief. Bhishmadev was not only a great family head of Maharaj Yudhisthira, but also he was a great philosopher and friend to him, his brothers and his mother. Since Maharaj Pandu, the father of the five brothers headed by Maharaj Yudhisthira had died, Bhishmadev was the most affectionate grandfather of the Pandavas and caretaker of the widow daughter-in-law Kunti Devi. <coughs> Although Maharaj Dhritarashtra, the elder uncle of Maharaj Yudhisthira, was there to look after them, his affection was more on the side of his hundred sons headed by Duryodhan. Ultimately, a colossal clique was fabricated to deprive the five fatherless brothers of the rightful claim of the kingdom of Hastinapur. There was great intrigue, common in imperial palaces, and the five brothers were exiled to the wilderness. But Bhishma Dev was always a sincerely sympathetic well-wisher, grandfather, friend, and philosopher to Maharaj Yudhisthira, even up to the last moment of his life. He died very happily by seeing Maharaj Yudhisthira to the throne Otherwise, he would have long ago quitted his material body instead of suffering agony over the undue sufferings of the Pandavas. He was simply waiting for the opportune moment because he was sure and certain that the sons of Pandu would come out victorious in the battlefield of Kurukshetra as his lordship, Sri Krishna, was their protector. As a devotee of the Lord, he knew that the Lord's devotee cannot be vanquished at any time. Maharaj Yudhisthira was quite aware of all these good wishes of Bhishma Dev, and therefore he must have been feeling the great separation. He was sorry for the separation of a great soul and not for the material body which Bhishma Dev relinquished. The funeral ceremony was a necessary duty although Bhishma Dev was a liberated soul. Since Bhishma Dev was, without issue, the eldest grandson, namely Maharaj Yudhisthira, was the rightful person to perform this ceremony. It was a great boon to Bhishma Dev that an equally great son of the family undertook the last rites of a great man. Shri Prabhupada Ki so therefore, it's explained that there are different uh, Mahajans. Swayambur 
ನಾರದ ಶಂಭೂರ್ ಕುಮಾರ ಕಪಿಲೋ ಮನು ಪ್ರಲದೋಚನಕೋ ಭೀಷ್ಮ ಬಲಿರ್ಭಯ ಶಿಖೀರ್ಭಯ there are 12 personalities who are said to be <coughs> authorities in vedic literature swayambhur who is that who is swayambhu lord brahma swayambhu literally means born born from himself like in one sense he was born from the navel so he had no uh, conventional father in that way narada narad muni nara narayan da to give therefore narada one who is traveling around the universe always giving narayan to others shambhu shiva is explained in bhagavatam isn't it um nimnaganam yatha ganga devanam achuto yatha vaishnavanam yatha shambhu purananam midam tatha nimnaganam yatha ganga of all rivers ganga is foremost devanam achuto yatha of all the gods achuta krishna is the foremost purananam midam tatha of all puranas bhagavatam is foremost and vaishnavanam yatha shambhu of all vaishnavas shiva is considered foremost pralado pralad is in it we say bhakta shiromani bhakta shiromani what is a shiromani is a crest jewel a crown jewel so this is he is like the crown jewel the crest jewel of devotees janak janak is mentioned in gita is uh, there's many many stories of how janak was such a advance he said once all the sages came to janak and they were wondering we are all tyagis we are all renunciates but you are always glorified we don't understand you are a king you have so many duties you have so many dharmas you have so many preoccupations yet you're always glorified as such a advanced devotee how are you able to think of so many things at once he said come back at lunch time i'll give you the answer so all the sages came back at lunch time and so he said please sit down take prasad so they all sat down in a row and as they sat down they looked above them and above every single seat was a sword and the sword was hanging on a thin piece of string so now imagine you're taking prashad <laughs> and there's a sword above you hanging on a thin piece of string so they looked at janak they said what's this he said it's part of the decor it's part of the design Janak looked at them and he said you already said I'm glorified as such a dharmic person so would I do anything to hurt you you relax you just take prashad so anyway they sat they took prashad at the end Janak said to them had prashad yes had prashad digested yes digested what were you thinking of while taking prashad <laughs> said we could only think of that thing he said this is how is possible to do your duties but at the same time have your mind fixed in completely something else so yes i have my kingly duties i have so many things i'm doing but my mind mana krishna niveshayet my mind is always fixed on krishna so this is how you can be doing one thing externally busy externally active but in your mind be completely fixed on something else like this janak was glorified pralado janako bhishma bhishma is the next great authority um balir bali maraj is in he was uh, he 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 is the embodiment of atmani vedanam 
as you know, he gave everything. Bali, uh, Veya Shikir, who is Veya Shiki? Sukadeva Goswami. Great authority. <coughs> Vayam and me. Who is me? Yamaraj. Yamaraj is the one speaking this way. So these are all the great authorities on devotional service. Bhishma Dev, he loved the Pandavas. Bhishma Dev was a great soul. He was a Mahajan. There is no question of Bhishma Dev in any way, shape or form uh, having any impurity. However, Leela, and because of showing the world the complexity of Dharma, he was caught in a situation where he was on the side of the Kauravas. He had to support the Kauravas, and therefore he had to seemingly uh, do things which seemed to be against the Pandavas, not in the interest of the Pandavas, but actually he was, um, he was always uh, completely uh, looking out for their well-being. So Bhishma Dev, in his humility, sometimes he will show his weakness, but actually, like for example, when he was on the bed of arrows, then Draupadi came to him. He was speaking all this amazing wisdom. So Draupadi looked at him and said, you're speaking all this amazing wisdom now. Where was all this wisdom when I was being disrobed in the gambling arena? Where was all the good wisdom then? And Bhishma Dev, in his humility, he said, I was living in the palace of the Kauravas, and therefore every single day I was eating their food. And therefore I was contaminated. And therefore I couldn't think straight. But now I'm on the bed of arrows. And all of that blood has been drained from my body. Therefore, I have regained my good consciousness. <laughs> That's how Bhishma Dev explained it. Anyway, the lesson for us is only eat prashadam. <laughs> <laughs> so it has an effect. But like this, uh, Bhishma Dev, very, very humble. But actually, uh, a great soul, uh, loved the Pandavas. And uh, here, Yudhisthira, yes, naturally he feels a lamentation when a great soul leaves the world. Um, then naturally, uh, there is great pain, a great feeling of loss. Even though we know, yes, the soul is eternal. Even though we know, yes, they have gone back to Krishna. Even then, it becomes very, very difficult. So Yudhisthira is overtaken with grief momentarily, but not so much that he forgets his duty, like we were talking yesterday. So naturally, when we lose a loved one, there is grief. Yudhisthira is feeling the grief. But here it says, Marj Yudhisthira was momentarily overcome by grief. In other words, in that moment, yes, there was great grief but not so much that it debilitated him from then going on and becoming emperor and doing his duty. So he performed the final sacrifice, rites for Bhishma Dev, and then uh, continued on with his duty. And when the time came, Yudhisthira also left, and then Parikshit um, took over like this. Grantaraj Shrimad Bhagavatam Ki Jai Prabhupada Ki Jai Three minutes if any last questions or comments yes. <coughs> Yeah. 
when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu travels to South India, then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu comes to Godavari. And there in Godavari, he meets Ramananda Rai. And he says to Ramananda Rai, uh, I am the sannyasi, I'm the supreme lord, but today you're going to give the class. And then Chaitanya Mahaprabhu asks him a question, what is the ultimate goal of life? Ramananda Rai begins speaking things and Mahaprabhu says, Eho bhaiya, age kaho ar. This is external, say something more, say something more. Like this, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu draws all of the philosophy out from Ramananda Rai. And later on, Ramananda Rai said, I am like a stringed instrument and you are like an expert musician. The sound seems to be coming from me. But actually it is your expert playing of me that is bringing out something good. So therefore the devotee Bhishma Dev understands Vedesha Sarveda Hameva Vedyo Krishna is here, he's the compiler of the Vedas, he knows everything. But still because Krishna has asked him, Krishna has come with the Pandavas and Krishna knows that the Pandavas are bewildered. Krishna knows that the Pandavas need direction. Krishna knows that they need to be uh, trained uh, in their dharma. Therefore, uh, Krishna encourages Bhishma Dev, and Bhishma Dev, as a service, then speaks uh, to the Pandavas like that. So, like this, we can see that a devotee uh, sometimes, uh, whatever the Supreme Lord wants to do, uh, whether it's speaking, whether it's doing a project, whether it's cooking, a devotee knows everything. The Lord can do it himself. He doesn't <coughs> need me. But when the devotee gets an opportunity to serve, then the devotee becomes very, very enthusiastic to take advantage. And so, on the order of Krishna, he spoke. Okay, I think we can finish here. Thank you so much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai.